Today's story is a story of overcoming hardships and transformation. We all know that adversity and challenge is when we become our strongest. And that is why I'm so happy to share an example of that with you today through Marty's story. Marty McLaughlin. This man has been through so much in his life and is still standing to tell the story. From a sudden loss that turned his world upside down to a near-death experience that altered his way of life, Marty has overcome it all. From a young age, Marty fell in love with fitness. He was fascinated how it can physically strengthen your body, but he also loved the social aspect of going to the gym and feeling welcomed by all. Today's story, though, is not focused on that. Today's story is more so about what it means to strengthen your mental endurance than your physical physique. Having a strong mental endurance is about not giving up no matter what life throws your way. Mental endurance is about continuing to fight, knowing that on the other side is growth that you could never have experienced without that adversity. I can sit here and tell you, keep fighting, it's worth it. But what does that mean to you without evidence to back up my claim? Nothing. That's why I am bringing you Marty's story today. Marty is living proof that you will overcome anything if you choose to, stronger than before. You're listening to the Cultivating Curiosity podcast, where everyone has a story to share. This is the story of Marty McLaughlin. Please state your name and what you do. My name is Marty McLaughlin, and I own Extreme Fitness Personal Training in Charlottesville, Pennsylvania. I am a certified personal trainer and nutritionist. Where did you grow up? Paint a picture for me of the town that you grew up in. What was it like? Uh, Well, I was born in Philadelphia proper, um, but uh, when I was one, uh, my parents moved to a wonderful new town at the time called Levittown. Uh, there was one in New York, there was one in southeastern Pennsylvania, and it was an amazing community of small houses with husbands and wives, with lots of children, everybody outside playing, neighbors passing cups of sugar over the fence. I mean, just what you in your mind could dream to be the perfect little neighborhood. Uh, that's where I spent uh, my entire childhood and most of my young adult life. What characteristics would you use to describe yourself as a child? Wow. Um, uh, that's a great question. Nerd. That's a good one. Uh, a dork, I love that. One. Me too. Um, you know, I, I still, uh, I, and people who know me still, we carry on a joke my whole life, which I still kind of friendly way bash my mother about every day because she sent me, I went to Catholic school and uh, she sent me to school every day with a bow tie. I was the only kid oh. wearing a bow tie. <laughs> Everyone else had neckties. And I said, Mom, please, this year, can you please buy me a necktie? But she bought me another bow tie. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I was being rebellious when I, uh, when I asked her to stop parting my hair on the side. And I wanted it parted in the middle. Oh, was, wow. <laughs> so, you know, um, I was an only child. And um, it, it was a bizarre experience. But uh, I, I, uh, I did my best to be friendly with everybody. I, I don't think anything's changed about my personality since then. So yeah, I was a dork. That's a fact. I love that. Take me back to the moment when you were a child and you were introduced to fitness for the very first time. What was that moment like for you? Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was an amazing moment really. Um, uh, you know, I, I, we all knew about fitness. So, you know, in, is this back in the eighties in 1980, I was 10 and uh, Jane Fonda was on TV, and the leg warmers were big, and jazzercise, and all these people gathering in rooms dancing. So, you know, there was there was this aura about it that was powerful and magical. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was in his prime, and bodybuilding was huge. And all of us, you know, young guys at the time thought, "Wow, this this must be where we all need to go." Mm-hmm. Um, but about a year later, um, I was visiting with my dad. My parents divorced when I was very young, and um, I did see my dad occasionally. 
And um, he came and picked me up and took me to his house. And he said, I want to show you something. And we went into this little room in his place and it had a weight bench in it. Back then, um, you know, barbells were still barbells, but uh, weights at home were plastic on the outside and were filled with concrete on the inside. Oh, gosh. And, uh, <laughs> that's how this little, you know, the primal little gym he had was. But, you know, I'll never forget it. You know, as he was showing me these, these things, which I didn't know what they were. But uh, he stood in front of me and he put his arms up and just did a fast little double bicep. And my dad is a lot like me or was at the time. We're, we're tiny Irish guys, five foot nine, 150 pounds. But all of a sudden I saw this, this thing <laughs> you know, that was standing up on his arm and I was, I was blown away by it. I can still see it in my mind perfectly and thought, how did that happen? You know, the memory I had of my dad as infrequently as I saw him was like all the other dads. They had little skinny tubular arms. There was no fitness in anybody's life. And all of a sudden, there was this, this meaty thing. And uh, he handed me a, a, a book, which I still have in my library today. Um, I recommend everybody gets it, as old as it is. Um, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. It was a wonderful book that went through Arnold, who everybody loves, doing great exercises. And that's what really got me started on it. I thought, I just, who does, you know, I shouldn't say it like that, but back then it was like who didn't want to be their dad mm -hmm. um, he was a great guy i idolized him in many ways and now he had this changed physique that i instantly wanted to try to find out how can i do this and that's that's what opened the door that's great so when you started getting into fitness and strengthening your body how did it make you feel emotionally uh it it was the a turning point in my life and um i i, I always hope when i meet people now I hope that I've created a environment for them that is as life changing to them as it was for me. The, the, the first gym I ever joined was a YMCA mm -hmm. and it was within walking distance of my house. I was 13 years old, so it was easy for me to get to. And, um, well, you know, the first day that I walked into that gym, they had kind of two separate areas. There was, and it's still like this today in most big gyms, there's the one area that's full of machines and equipment. And then there's the other area that's full of dumbbells and barbells and clankety clanks and concrete floors. And, you know, some people just won't go near that space, but that was the space I wanted to be in because when I was watching Arnold Schwarzenegger do his thing in Lou Ferrigno, that's where they were. They were lifting barbells and dumbbells. And as a, a you know, 12, 13 year old boy at uh, God, Back then, I probably weighed about 110 pounds. I was you know, a strong wind would have blew me away. Uh, here were all these old schoolers, 30s, 40s, 50 year old, big, big bully men inside that room that just pulled me in and treated me like I was one of their children. And they made me laugh and they helped me understand and they made me feel like I was a part of something. And as an only child, um, you know, growing up in a Catholic school environment like that, you know, there wasn't, it, I wasn't included in a lot. Let me just say it like that. So uh, with, and I know I spoke to you briefly about the issues I had with my legs not working when I was younger. So um, to, to feel like when I walked in a room of tough people, that they were happy I walked into that room at that age, it changed my whole perspective on life. And um, that was where, that's the addiction. That's where that grabbed me. That's great. So what was your plan as you were growing up and graduating high school and about to go off to college? Was fitness on, in your radar at the time? What was your action plan after that? I wish it was more, you know, a uh, hindsight 2020. We know this, Yeah. Um, you know, coming from the uh, my, my very first real job outside of delivering newspapers. I was one of those paper boys for many years, knocking on doors and collecting for the papers we delivered. Um, uh, was was a manual labor job uh, working with a pool company that dug out in-ground pools. So, um, I, you know, I was one of the guys that would go down into the 12-foot hole with a shovel and smooth out the bottom and throw the dirt 12 feet above my head. There was nothing easy about it, but um, it earned me some cash money in my hands, and that led me into landscaping, and I did ground maintenance, and wound up actually working for, at the time, the largest retail nursery down here in Lower Bucks County at the time. 
And it was amazing. We were going to mansions and building patios and bridges and ponds and this whole thing of, wow, somebody, somebody had to draw this on a piece of paper and create it in their minds and then present it to these people and they liked it. And here we are like painting a picture, putting it together. So I really fell in love with not digging the holes anymore. I wanted to get the guy <laughs> on the other side of the pencil. Of course. So um, I made a decision to go to Delaware Valley College, which is now Delaware Valley University. They finally got their university status last year and uh, went in for a double major of landscape architecture and ornamental horticulture. And my mom didn't want me to do it. My dad at the time didn't want me to do it. Um, they just thought it was a, a poor direction to go in, but it was, it was what I wanted to do. And uh, so coming out of high school, I, was, I, was, I knew what I wanted. I knew where I wanted to go to school. It was not easy, but you know, my mom helped me make that happen. I got my degree on time, got out, got a job immediately. And that's where I spent really the next 10 years of my life um, working at that. Fitness, however, was always there. I always went to the gym. I went to the gym on college campus. There was a Bally's that was a few miles away. I went there. When I graduated and came back home, uh, there was an LA Fitness that was starting to open up, and that's what led me into the career I'm in now. But um, there was really never a time in my life from when I was about 12 through today that unless I was too injured for one reason or another, um, I, I worked out every every day. It's just a part of my life. Okay. So let's talk about your early life for a second. You go to high school, you graduate college, you're working in landscape architecture, and you are married and you have two beautiful baby boys. Explain to me, describe to me that point of your life. Was it a happy-go-lucky time in your life? Paint a picture for us. It was extremely hard. I will not lie. It was mm-hmm. really difficult. Um, uh, while I was in college, so I was in my junior year, um, I was dating my wife at the time. And that's when, as we say it, we got pregnant. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't really planned. We had to make some decisions. We were very much in love with each other at the time. And I thought, I'm going to pull this off. Um, This wasn't the plan, but we're going to have this baby. I'm going to finish college. Everything is going to be okay. And that's the plan we stuck with. So um, I was 21 when my first son was born, and I was still in college at the the most aggressive part of college. And for a landscape architecture major, uh, what that translated into was um, all the other schoolwork you had to do was what it was, and generally about two or three days before finals would happen, our architecture professors would say, this is what you need to do, this is what it needs to look like, get your drawings done, you have 24 hours to do it. So then it was pulling all-nighters, sitting in a room full of architecture tables with 25 other people and trying to get this done. It was very hectic. Um, so I wasn't able to live on campus anymore, but thankfully it was only a 45 minute drive to my home. So I would be back and forth trying to be a dad at 21, too young to try to be a dad. If anybody's thinking about that, guys, let me do you a favor. <laughs> Please wait. <laughs> Give yourself some time to get situated financially, professionally, personally. But, um, uh, it, it, I mean, what's, how many great things can happen to you in your life when you're standing next to, um, your partner and a baby's being born, it's something you're never going to forget as long as you live. It's uh, another life-changing moment that um, radically changes how you think, um, your perspective on life, who you are, what you're going to do with the life that's in front of you. So um, mm-hmm. it was amazing. And uh, two years, four years later, I should say, two years later, sadly, she had a miscarriage. And we decided to try again. And uh, my second son was born. And so we had uh, boy number one, boy number two, four years apart. And um, at the time, now I'm out of college. I've got a house, um, working like crazy, trying to do what I could do um, in order to provide an environment for my wife so she could stay home and take care of the two boys because that's just how I didn't want to put them in daycare. I wanted to have that family unit going on. But, you know, what I didn't realize was all that time for the first four years, five years, it's not at all what she really wanted. And uh, she 
did it for as long as she could do it. And then when my boys were four and two, she decided she had had enough and uh, came to me and said, look, this is uh, all wrong for me. I really, I'm not enjoying being a mom. I don't want to be a mom. I'm not enjoying being a husband or a wife. I really don't want to do this anymore. I want to leave. And so, um, wow. you know, I called my dad at the time, uh, my amazing Irish dad, and said, tell me what to do. And he said, uh, did she look you in the eyes when she said it? I said, yeah, yeah, she did. So he said, you got to let her go then, because whatever you try to do to fix it, it's not going to work. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, I trust my dad. I always will. And uh, so that was the end of that. I let her go. And she packed up her thing. And she left, and she never came back. She was just gone, just like that. So wow. now, now life got really difficult. Here I am. I've got two boys. I don't really have much of a support system. Um, I come from a very dysfunctional, broken-up family, and um, I'm trying to work from 6 o'clock in the morning until 8 or 9 o'clock at night uh, as often as I can. So life, life became instantly, unbelievably hard. Absolutely. And I can imagine the emotions you were feeling like heartbreak. I can oh. imagine heartbreak, but also anger at the anger. fact that you're left with these two beautiful boys that you now have to raise as a single dad. That's real. Oh. That's very scary. It was, uh, it was, it was like looking at Mount Everest. I really didn't mm -hmm. know what to do. There was times that, I mean, what do you do? I just cried. I, I didn't know what to do. I was exactly as you said, I was angry, I was depressed, I was confused, I was a total basket case. Um, and and I, I'm, gonna, I'm sure through this whole conversation we have, I'm gonna keep reflecting back on the gym, on my gym family, on that environment, because it has been my anchor more times in my life than I can even remember, I am sure. Um, the stability of that, um, the stress relief in that, um, the no judgment atmosphere in that my ability to talk to people who were like family to me, but magically like I am for my clients I work with right now, they were unattached from everybody else I knew. So it was okay for me to tell them how I felt and what was going on because they didn't know anybody else I knew. There was no way for that to come back around to me. Mm -hmm. uh, any degrees of separation. So, um, you know, thank the gym for my sanity during those times because I just, I, I really, I was exhausting everybody I knew uh, trying to be my therapist, trying to be my friend, and trying to be my assistant because a lot of times I had to leave the house before my children woke up. And there was times I came home on that same day after they were already put to bed. Uh, so my mom was an amazing help. Um, my neighbors that were around me, uh, my aunts and my uncles and all those folks, they lived so far away. There was really not much I, I could do. So I was radically trying to figure out what am I going to do? And it, it was it was complicated. So when did you realize that you needed to make a change in your life? I'm assuming at this point you're still working as a landscape architect, but you, like you said, you had that backbone of the gym and its community. When did you realize I need to do something different so that I can see my kids, so that I can raise my family? Yeah, you know, it's, um, uh, after however many times it was that that same situation we just talked about where I left the house before they woke up, and I came home after they were in bed. I knew it then. This can't, I can't be this dad. I was the kind of dad, you know, when, when my wife was there, uh, you know, that we went, my, my kids and I, we did everything together. We rode bikes together. We went to the park together. Uh, everywhere we went, I had one of their little hands in each one of mine. You know, I carry, it was just, we had such a wonderful relationship and I couldn't imagine it drifting apart like that. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, um, you know, I think uh, the universe or God, whatever it is you believe in, uh, it does good things for good people. And uh, one of my regular trips to the gym, to an LA fitness that had opened up, the uh, manager of the fitness department just walked up to me one day and said, you know, I don't know what it is you do for a living, but you really ought to think about getting certified as a personal trainer, because I have to tell you, I see more people coming up to you asking you how to do stuff than they're asking my own staff. So <laughs> it 
No, if you just get certified, I'm going to hire you because I know I'm going to get you working here. These people in this facility, they love you. And this was at the time here in Lower Bucks County. Um, it was L.A. Fitness's flagship location on the East Coast. It was 50,000 square feet. It was the biggest gym anybody in this area had ever seen. And, you know, in my mind, when I was working out there, I would see the trainers walking around with their bright blue polo shirts on with the big word trainer on their back. And I would say, you know, I know I can do what they're doing. I know I can. You know? So um, I, I had to look at that as a message from the universe to do this. So um, I did a little bit of research and decided to go through ISSA, the International Sports Science Association at the time, I think still today. It's probably one of the most recognized correspondence style online and textbook courses. It, uh, the book that came to me looked more like a phone book than a textbook. I was totally overwhelmed. Um, outside of reading Muscle and Fitness magazine and little books here and there, I really didn't have a lot of anatomy and physiology experience. This was a whole new thing for me. But... I'm no stranger to studying. I'm no stranger to hard work. I wanted to make this happen. It took me about six months to chip away at that certification while I was still struggling as the single parent doing the job. But once I took the test, uh, I got a 98 on the test. They sent me the paperwork. I walked into the gym the next day. They hired me on the spot. I took a chance, called the folks I was working for as an architect and said, I got to go. I gave two weeks notice. I did the two-week transition, and in the two weeks that followed when I started as a trainer at L.A., in two weeks, I had a full-time book. I was scheduled. I was working from 5 in the morning until about 6 o'clock at night. I had a couple of short breaks during the day, which was great during the summer. I was able to go home, see my kids. I was still having to work with babysitters galore at the time, but I was just a stone's throw away now. And I was a little more in charge of my schedule. Uh, six months following that point, they basically uh, created a head trainer position, which they had not had at that point, and gave me that honor. So, you know, all of a sudden, all these big doors were opening up for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 uh, I was having an impact on people. And it was amazing. It was wonderful. So I love that. That's, it that's just how. is proof that when you are doing what you are meant to do, the universe, God, like you said, whatever you believe in, it's there to support you. Yeah, there is a such thing as finding your calling. And, uh, yeah. you know, the, the handle I picked up there, um, there was a, a, a client who had had a massive stroke. He was in his late 60s. His whole left side was paralyzed. He was a doctor. He was such a wonderful man. And he had been working with another trainer for several years ahead of me. And decided he wanted to make a switch. He had seen what I was doing with people and wanted to work with me. And all he ever wanted to do is walk. And, um, you know, I've, still to this day, I always say to people, I don't care how hurt you are. We never say never. It might not be perfect, but we're going to find a way. And um, so over the course of about a year in training him, I would get him up out of the chair and make him stand. We got one step and he would have to sit down. And we, we literally worked it a step at a time. Long story short, um, on the last day that we worked together in that facility, he was able to stand up arm in arm with me. We walked all the way across the gym to the juice bar where he got his little drink after everyone. As the girl who ran the juice bar saw him coming, she's crying. I'm crying. <laughs> he's crying. The whole gym is cheering. Everybody's got their arms up. It was, I'm getting goosebumps all over my arms. Yeah. It was um, an amazing moment. So, you know, when that was all done, I went to the locker room. Guy stopped me and he says, do you know what they're calling you in here? I said, no, man. He said, the healer. That's what they're calling wow. you, the healer. So I, I have, that's my email address on AOL. And it's just something that's kind of stuck with me um, from that point on. And um, it, it's been a, a wonderful ride um, mm -hmm. going from in the gym to where I am now. It's been an amazing transition. So, Speaking of now, you are the founder and owner of Extreme Fitness, but I'm curious, what enticed you to go off on your own and start your own gym? Because you were clearly having abundant success at yeah. LA Fitness and having a huge impact on people. What, what enticed you to start your own business? I, I saw it when I started to work there um, because the gym was so large and it was so well known that I was 
I had just kind of walked in it off the ground level and went right to the top of the food chain as far as personal training went. But that's just how naive I was at the time. I, you know, I look at it now and I realize that personal trainers coming out of school, coming out of just being certified, that's really where they need to go. They need to go to a big gym, get their feet wet, learn to work with lots of people. If they discover along the way that it, that it was their calling, that they're that passionate, that they really feel positive about it, and they think they're good enough to survive on their own outside that facility, that's when they should go and try to make their own name and build their own brand. I probably never would have left. Um, but my own style of training started to bloom in that gym where a lot of trainers just kind of took their clients from the chest machine to the bicep machine to the back machine to the ab machine, count numbers. That's what they thought personal training was. For me, the, the machine work was just, I just couldn't stand it anymore. You're like, another machine, no way. I wanted to make people move. I wanted to make them jump. I wanted to make them run. I wanted to teach them how to use this machine. That's. That, you know, when we did gym class as kids, that's what we did. We climbed, we ran, we skipped, we rolled, we pushed, we pulled. So I started to, to implement that type of fitness in a gym that was full of equipment. And the management just wasn't quite prepared to have that. And on numerous occasions, the general manager of the gym just kind of pulled me aside and said, you know, Marty, you know, we love you. And you're the busiest trainer in the building. But you're getting a little too intense and we want you to calm it down. We just want you to follow the gym rules. So um, I made an attempt to get my clients off the main gym floor and I brought them into a racquetball court and thought, I'll just compartmentalize them and then no one will know. <laughs> On the other side of the racquetball court was a row of treadmills. So, you know, if there was 50 treadmills, the first 15 had nobody, the second 20 had everybody and the other line had nobody because everybody would get on the treadmills right in front of the racket <laughs> court because all they wanted to do was see what I was making people do. So, you know, it was, it was clearly working, but the gym just really didn't want it. And, um, you know, to end the story, I was working with a guy, may he rest in peace, he passed away a few years ago, um, who was a financial advisor for Verizon. And he just said to me, you know, Marty, you're, you're meant for something much more than this. And um, if you haven't thought about starting your own business, I'd love to help you make a business plan. And I think if you just do things the way I'm going to ask you to do them, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine because people love you and they're, they're going to follow you. So he put me together a two-year business plan, nothing big, nothing far, and said, if you just do what I'm telling you, by the time you're two years in, you should be here. And... Um, when I decided to leave and, and make this crazy transition, um, I was probably at the end of the two year period off of his financial mark by about five grand. So he was completely on point. Uh, he uh, coached me through my first two years as a business owner. And uh, he was really one of the main reasons outside of my own personal drive, I think that I made it because trying to start a business inside your home inside two one of the bedrooms i was working it was no bigger than the one i'm in right now it's and i said it all the time this is never going to work this, there's no way this is going to work but 20 years later here i am and uh we're still going strong so yeah. that man helped me um you, you can't do anything great in this world without help you can't do it by yourself and uh you know i've learned to accept help it wasn't always easy I'm a stubborn Irishman. I wanted to do things on my own. I can do it. Just leave me alone. I was an only child. So you learn to do things on your own. Mm -hmm. But um, I've, I've learned that help is a wonderful thing. And I look forward to taking it. Wow. So today, Extreme Fitness is in a 7,000 square foot space. Clearly a lot larger than the room that you're currently sitting in. <laughs> Paint a picture for me a little bit more of the early days of extreme fitness because I think it's so powerful to see what hard work and determination and drive, where it can take you if you really put your mind to something. Yeah, you know, and you just have to let nature take its course. I think even as I say to folks I'm coaching through weight loss, the worst mistake you're ever going to make is put a date 
on something. Yeah. Don't say, I want to do this by this point. You mm-hmm. will fail 100% of the time. And, um, you know, just like we're all sitting at home right now wondering, what are we going to do tomorrow? You, you just have to let the cards fall. Um, they will probably fall in some very uncomfortable places sometimes. And that's when, you know, like Sylvester Stallone says, it's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. You just have to be prepared. So um, I took my life savings at the time, which was probably about $6,000, you know, because I was still a, a single parent trying to pull all this off and uh, went to a local, uh, I guess it was kind of a, 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 it was a little outlet that sold fitness equipment. Some of it was more commercial in size and in stature, and some of it was designed for home equipment. I picked two pieces of equipment that I could afford that looked like they had a small footprint that would give me a lot of exercise options to do. And uh, they brought it to the house. They put one piece uh, in one of my second floor bedrooms, and that bedroom was too small to put the other one in. So across the hall was the second upstairs bedroom. They put the other piece in there. I had to move my children into one room now downstairs. So they were immediately sacrificing. We only had a four bedroom home. So I had one bedroom. My boys had another. The two upstairs bedrooms became the gym. I bought some balls and some bands and a few dumbbells and just some small peripheral stuff. Um, I had about six or eight people that um, when I left LA fitness said to me, look, you know, we're not, we're not going to LA Fitness because we like that gym. We're going there at this point now because you're there, because you're our trainer, and that's where we want to be. So we're going to come with you. So I didn't have the full book. I knew I had to leave it. The right thing to do was to walk away from LA Fitness as a friend because I still wanted to work out there. You know that that was going to still be my home gym. So we were able to part as friends, which was great. A few people left which they didn't really notice. And that was my little core group. Of course, I relied heavily on them to promote me because this was back in 2000. So we didn't have cell phones then. There was no Facebook then. There was no way to get your word out. So I had no money to advertise. So it literally came down to them being a billboard for me and me just trying to do the best I could. So uh, for the first whole year, that's where the business rolled right from the second floor of my house. My first client would be knocking on my door at six in the morning, waking my children up and they would bump up my stairs and get on a treadmill on the second floor and boom, 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 boom. boom. They're running. And every once in a while they would miss footing and go flying off and tumble on the floor. You know, things that happen in every gym <laughs> happen in every gym. Yeah. So um, it, it was, uh, it was an adventure, but I think fortunately for me uh, getting that tag as the healer, when I was at the bigger gym, uh, the people who came with me, uh, you know, with all due respect, were, 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 um, were not the healthiest people. I had a woman who had tragic dystonia. So um, she would go for occasional Botox injections because her neck muscles would start to seize hmm. until she was stuck in a position like this. And then they would give her Botox and slowly it would come back down. She would be good for two or three months. And then the muscles would start to seize again mm-hmm. and she was frozen. Um, I had a couple of folks with uh, fused lumbar spines. Um, so uh, I had the stroke patient who I was working with who I taught to walk. So it, 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 uh, it solidified me as a trainer that had some talent. That wasn't just a rep counter or a babysitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I wasn't getting business because I looked like a trainer. Mm-hmm. I never really wanted that. So the first year, as with any business, it was a struggle, but it was getting a little bigger and a little bigger. And a few more people started showing up and my phone started to ring. By the time my first year was done, it was literally just, it just got so busy that I, I needed to get it out of my house. My kids needed some of their life back. You know, they needed to sit in front of a television in the living room in their pajamas and watch cartoons. It had to be a home again. So um, I had made enough money at that point to save up to have uh, the Amish. God bless those Amish people. They know how to build a building. (laughs) They They do. They came down. (laughs) They built up an amazing, it was a shed is what it was. But uh, they had to build it for me as if it was going to be an exterior apartment so I could run it as a legal business. 
and we had heat and air conditioning and ceiling fans and it was 18 by 32 so it was about 400 square feet it felt like the Taj Mahal everybody was so happy that we had this little building out in the yard and uh, that's where the business stayed for the next three years while I was trying to build up capital to take the step into moving it into a commercial location um, before that whole next level of madness happened to me in my life, which made me think I was going to lose it all. But um, yeah, uh, it, it, there was times where um, in the beginning, uh, trying to raise the two boys and, and live this dream that I just didn't want to give up on. And God bless them at the time as young kids, they wanted me to do it because now here I am, I'm at home all the time. So they had constant access to me and I know how much that meant to them. So they wanted this to work mm. as much as I did, but it literally got to the point where um, in my neighborhood where I lived in Levittown, there was a Salvation Army and I ended up putting my two kids in the car and driving down there with a couple of bills in my hand and my copy of my taxes from that year and asked them to give me food because we had nothing. I was out of money. Uh, I couldn't food shop and um, I didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. And uh, that's my Salvation Army plug. They were wonderful people. They popped open my trunk and filled it with cereal and milk and bread and cookies and a turkey and it, it was it was amazing. It was the first time I had ever really experienced being on the giving back end of anything. Mm -hmm. And that has also followed me through my life and, and how I do what I do. But that was like getting an infusion of hope into my veins. And it made me work even harder mm -hmm. after that to, to push harder and, and, and make this work. So Marty, you are growing your business you're growing extreme fitness you moved into the Taj Mahal as you like to call it in your backyard which I love and like life does it throws you a curveball right so I want to talk about what happened to you on the night in July in 2007. It was the craziest day of my life for sure probably um, so I had this amazing client who was also a massage therapist and, uh, you know, one thing we did, uh, you know, was a great way to be a business owner and know another business owner and we would barter services. So she would come and I would train her. And when I needed a massage, she would take great care of me. She only lived about three miles away. And um, uh, she had an amazing golden retriever named Lucy. And she gave me a call one day and said, Marty, you know, I'm just um, I just wanted to tell you we're going to be putting Lucy down tomorrow. She was a really old, beautiful animal. But when I went over for those massages, all I did was play with Lucy. She was wonderful. I am a big time dog lover. Mm -hmm. So I said, please, you know, let me come by. I just want to say goodbye. So um, I had a, uh, a Yamaha V-Star 1100 cruising motorcycle at the time. I loved it. I drove that to her house and played with Lucy for about an hour and said my goodbyes. And it was starting to get dark so um i decided i it was time to go i never really like riding the motorcycle in the dark and uh so on my way home you know coming through a traffic light um i'm looking ahead of me i see a uh, a bar and a takeout on the right hand side which is on my side as i'm driving i see a minivan getting ready to pull out of that lot and go on the opposite direction of a four-lane highway and I'm looking at her. I can see her in the driver's seat. I see her looking right at me. I wasn't at all concerned. Um, through second gear, I'm into third gear, ready to pull the throttle. And that's when she decided to just step on the gas and fly right out of that parking lot. And it was, you know, every, time slows down. It's amazing. When, uh, when, when that kind of tragedy comes, you really... Uh, it, it seems like things are happening in, in slow motion. And I remember having the realization at that point that was, <sighs> she never saw me. She didn't know I was coming. And she misjudged the turn completely and actually wound up going the opposite way directly in my lane. So, you know, you think you have time. I thought, I'm going to pull this off. I grabbed on to the handles. I squeezed onto the gas tank. And I just laid it over onto its side thinking, I'm just going to slide right in on this and I'm going to be okay. But uh, physics is impressive. And I get it now why they say if you're not wearing a seatbelt in a car, 
and you hit something at 35 miles an hour, how it will kill you. 35 miles an hour feels like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was probably doing about 35 when we got connected at the front end. But um, I remember hearing the, the, the bang of the metal. I remember hearing glass shatter and everything went from being as clear and focused as you are to me right now to being just an absolute kaleidoscope of colors and swirls. I was ejected off of the motorcycle end over end. Uh, she was driving a minivan and I, I cleared the whole minivan mm -hmm. and landed in the middle of the four lane highway, right on the double yellow line, right on the back of my head. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, the, the sound that came out of that hit was so crazy when I hit the ground. I just assumed, you know, as I'm tumbling, brum, 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 the last tumble I made stopped me on my hands and on my knees. And I kind of looked up. And as soon as I looked up, this whoosh went straight across my face, which was another car that drove right by the front of me. As I realized, oh, my God, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of the street. I got to get up. So I stood up and I looked at my body. I looked at my hands. I was covered in, in road rash. Um, my, my fingers moved. My legs moved. I said, oh, my God. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm alive. And then my eyes were just starting to get fuzzier and fuzzier. So I'm, I'm trying to shake my eyes off. And I realized I got to get out of the street. So I did a 180. I kind of hobbled across the street. And, you know, there's the power of endorphins, man. Um, they are real. And they will stop any level of pain you're having in order to give you an opportunity to get safe. I guess that's the best way I can describe it. Because when my feet hit the curb and I got out of the street, the floodgate of pain came. And it just felt like somebody was trying to, somebody had stuck something between two vertebrae in my neck and was trying mm -hmm. to pop my head off. It was the most unbelievably uncomfortable tragic pain i've really ever experienced and it came on like a lightning bolt so i thought okay my neck is broken so i just sat down on the ground and i laid back and once i hit that laying back position that's when my life changed my left arm stopped working my left leg stopped moving um the pain would not stop escalating my phone, my cell phone at the time was in my left pocket and I couldn't move my left arm to get it. I kept trying to reach across my body with my right arm, but by then the, the, the uh, soft tissue that was all damaged in the accident had started to swell. So my hand just looked like a big swollen bubble full of water. And any time my skin touched anything, <laughs> It was like being on fire. I just, I didn't know what to do. So I just, at one point I remember saying to myself, dude, stop it. Just get your phone, get your phone. But you, the pain was so intolerable. I just couldn't do it. I knew I had my 911 in my pocket, but I couldn't get it. Uh, it was dark. My insides of my body hurt so bad. I just, uh, I figured I have internal bleeding. Nobody's here. Nobody knows where I am. And I'm going to die here. I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I looked up at the stars. I talked to God. You know, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, um, born and raised that way. I asked him to take care of my wife. Um, wherever she would be, I asked him to take care of my children. And just, you know, let's, let's get on with this thing. And uh, like, a, like an angel's voice, I heard a woman who said, Honey, Stop struggling to get whatever's in your pocket. I don't know if that van that I saw drive out of here was the one that hit you, but I got its license plate when it took off, and I'm going to go dial the police. Oh, my God, I got to take a step back. So while I'm making my peace with God, <laughs> how can I forget this part? I hear the car door close, and all of a sudden, the woman's face pops up right over my face. The woman She's that hit you. Over something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how could I do this one out? And, you know, at the time, I didn't realize that was the one who hit me. It could have been anybody, but she just looked me in the face and she said, are you okay? 
And I said, no, no, I'm really, really not okay. I'm not okay. I can't move my left side. I need you to dial 911. And she never moved. She just oh kind of stared God. at me just like that. And I thought, maybe maybe she doesn't really speak a lot of English. So I thought, I'm going to say it again. So I said, I need you to dial 911. And she kind of uprighted her body. And then she just started creeping away. So I'm, I'm watching her disappear from my vision. And all I could do is move my eyes because my head wouldn't turn. Mm. Because my neck was broken. So I thought, okay, she's, uh, she's going to go dial 911. And then I heard her car door close. Mm. And a couple of clicks. And I know what those clicks are. Those clicks are the gear getting put in. So she thought that she would be able to get away by going behind the bar. So she drove past me once. She went behind the bar and there was no exit. So she had to turn around, come back and drive past me a second time. Oh. And that's she left. She left me in the street. Oh, Marty. Mm. So she, and when she, when I heard that car go, I just. I'm what done. Is, <laughs> what this is, is it. She, how could this happen? How could this happen to me? You know, not that anybody's any more special than another person, but I remember being selfish and saying to me, mm -hmm. how could this happen to me right now? Mm -hmm. So enter the woman's voice who said, I got the license plate. You know, the next thing I know, um, <laughs> the comic relief of the story happens. This guy comes over the top of me. He's totally silver haired. He's got a, a gray braid. That's probably two feet long hanging down the side. And he says, bro, were you knocked out when you got hit? I said, I, I don't know. I don't know. He goes, man, bro, because you look like a rag doll, man. Your body was just flopping round and round. So it's becoming <laughs> apparent to me that there were some witnesses now who saw this. And uh, he said, is there anything in your pockets I got to get out of there for you before the cops come? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> There's nothing in my pocket. He goes, okay, good, good. Because something like this happened to me once. And I got, <laughs> they, they arrested me, man. So <laughs> He was looking out for you. <laughs> so thankful you are here. Because, I mean, you're making me laugh. Like, this is so great. So ambulance shows up. They put me on the flat cart. On the way to the hospital, they have those super scissors. They start cutting off my clothes. And um, I was wearing a, uh, a Superman. I'm, I'm such a huge fan. I was uh, wearing a Superman muscle shirt at the time. And they grabbed a hold of it and pulled it out. And I just said, please, 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 guys, please don't cut this shirt. I just, I feel like it's the only reason I live. I, I need this shirt. And they said, guy, we got to cut it off. We got to make sure that there's no other injuries to your body. So the whole time they're cutting up this shirt, I'm crying in the bed. I can't believe you're cutting this shirt. But, um, I went to the trauma center and uh, they couldn't give me any pain medication for hours because they didn't want to mask any other injuries I might have. So I was getting MRIs, I was getting x-rays, I was getting CAT scans, internals. They wanted to make sure everything was all right. Finally, the trauma surgeon came in and said, what do you think is wrong? I said, I think I have a, a broken neck. He said, you do. What do you think's broken? I said, if I had to guess, I would say, I don't know, C7. He said, not C5. It's the paralyzing vertebrae. Mm. He said, um, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a personal trainer. My mom was sitting in my bedside. And he said, not anymore. Let's just hope we can get you walking again. And he just stood up and walked out. My mom fell apart. She was crying. I'm like, mom, stop it. Stop it. I mean, I was so angry. And I'll never not be angry at that doctor for being that way. I said, dude, he doesn't know anything about me. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I'm going to fight. I'm going to, I'm going to find my way out of this man, but don't mm -hmm. you go there. Stop it. So I spent seven days in trauma. Uh, I spent seven days in a regular hospital bed and uh, it was the, on the last day um, that they kept me was the day I asked if I could have a walker. And they brought a walker in, and it took me probably about 10 minutes to find a way to get my body uprighted. Thank God I wasn't haloed. It was a stable fracture. The whole left side of the vertebrae was broken, but there was a hairline fracture on the right side holding it together. 
So they put me in a full restriction collar. And uh, when I finally got that little walker outside the room door into the hallway, the whole nurse's station erupted with claps and cheers. And um, it, it just gave me, it get, again, others gave me hope. So um, I was transferred back to my house. I spent the next three months in a hospital bed and never could get past the walker. I just couldn't get beyond the pain. Um, I couldn't get beyond the depression of how my life had changed. Mm. Uh, clients that I had still paid their monthly invoices as if they were training. A chiropractor uh, that I worked for for years um, before I became my own business owner, paid my mortgage for me. People wow. just kind of came out and did what they could to help me focus on healing, but I just couldn't get over the hurdle of it. I, I didn't I didn't know what to do. So to kind of close out that whole section of the story, one day somebody brought the mail in and um, there was a long uh, legal sized letter um, from Sacramento, California. I don't know anybody in Sacramento, but you know, what do you think? You just open it, I rip it open. It's got a gold seal at the top of the letter, which I just completely ignored and started reading down the letter. Dear Martin, Maria and I heard about your accident, and we're so sorry this has happened to you. And I'm, I'm reading it through and trying to understand what, wh who is this? And then down at the bottom, it's, you know, it's signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just so amazing. So... I tell the story a lot, and I always say the same thing. I think well, you and I might have discussed it, but I went right to the back, and I read it a second time because the second time it wasn't my own voice I heard. It was it was the Terminator. You know, it was his <laughs> voice. I could hear his voice saying every word. It was it was amazing. And the bottom line of it was it's time to get out of the bed. You got to get up, and you got to go. We want to see you back at the Arnold Classic in Ohio and, you know, get back to your people. So uh, that was the first day I decided to open the front door of the house and get the walker out the door. And the next day it was to the driveway and the next day it was to the neighbor's house. And I just kept going and going and going. Uh, one day I got so far that I was in so much pain. I ended up sitting on a curb crying and calling somebody and having somebody pick me up in a car because I couldn't make it back. But you know, that's where I had to start making decisions. But that, that shove, that amazing letter, I don't know where it came from. I don't know who I was working with that had access to that person and got that letter to come to my house. But uh, it's framed and it hangs in my gym. It'll hang in every gym I ever owned for the rest of my life. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. So he'll never hear me say it, but thank you so much for you doing that for me. You never know that. I know, right? It got me out of that bed, and yeah. uh, it, it was amazing. Thank God for it. Man. Marty, how did your perspective on life change after this accident? I know I hear a lot of stories about people who either are cancer survivors or accident survivors like yourself who go through something so traumatic, and they come out on the other side not only stronger but with a whole different perspective of life. How did that change for you? Yeah, I, I will tell you this, it, 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 in a good way, not in a bad way, it took my fear of almost everything away. Hmm. Um, you know, wow. understanding that you really are the master of your own destiny, understanding that no success is ever going to come without pain and failure. And I felt like, you know, there was no greater level of, of physical pain I could have endured. Um, there was no, at the time, higher level of full-on depression and feeling of loss that I could have experienced. And um, it, uh, it, it, I learned to use all of that as a tool to motivate others into realizing that it doesn't matter what has happened to them or what's going to happen to them that you can find a way through it. Um, there's just, there's, there's no excuses in anything in life. And to have had that perspective of, of almost dying and losing it all, uh, people have said to me, I say it to myself, look, you weren't done. 
there was some other greater purpose left for you to fill here, man. I was not wearing a helmet. I was wearing a muscle shirt and a pair of shorts and a pair of boots. I landed on my head. I mean, there was just no way that I should have survived that accident. No way. So um, I just, you know, I, I look at life every day as it's a gift. None of us are guaranteed it tomorrow, no matter how healthy we think we are. Anything can happen. And to be given a second chance is very rare. And I plan on using it to the best of my ability every day, no matter how hard it is, no matter how tired I am, no matter how much I want to complain, no matter how many times I've wanted to quit. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm here for a reason. So it has, it has turned me into an entirely different person that's much more respectful of each day that I wake up. That's beautiful. I love hearing that perspective. Thank you so much for sharing your story and inspiring people everyone listening, no, no matter what point of their life they're in right now, I know that everyone, including myself, took away something so powerful from that. Thank you so much, Marty. My pleasure, man. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And just, you know, if, if I have a, a last piece of advice to anybody, it's that just don't ever get comfortable where you are. Mm -hmm. That whole story about letting the grass grow under your feet, as soon as you stop, you rust. As soon as you start rusting, you're not living anymore. You're dying. So, you know, push on. If you make a goal, awesome. Congratulations. Set a new one. Always be working for something different, something better, something that's going to impact others in a positive way. No matter how small of a thing you think it is, just find a way to keep on bettering yourself, educate yourself, focus on your health, Take care of other people, be happy, love unconditionally, and um, uh, be a functional part of a tough society to be living in wherever you are. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's great. It's a great feeling to be a ray of light. And even though at times we may not be, we learn to rely on others that are. And uh, when together we can do great things. Yeah. I know before I pressed the record button today on this episode, I told you that I wanted to focus this episode around the idea of mental endurance. You clearly work in the fitness space where you help people become physically stronger and increase their physical endurance. But I, what I love about your story is you exemplify what it means to have such strong mental endurance. And I need to know, and it might be what you just said as well, but if you could sum up tools as to how you've strengthened your mental endurance over the years through everything you've been through, through your wife leaving you and you becoming a single dad to building a business from the ground up to almost dying from a hit and run accident. Those are huge milestones that happen in your short lifetime so far. What, yeah. what has gotten you through those times? How, how have you strengthened your mental endurance during those times? Uh, you know, I just, um, uh, and at the root of it, I'm going to say, I, this is the worst answer. You know, I don't know why I hate to give up. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Um, it's, it's, it's not something I've ever been really good at doing. Um, I, I, I want to be successful, but at the same time, I'm very comfortable in a life that just pays my bills. You know, I, I don't, I'm not aspiring to have a mansion and to have a Rolls Royce and to be traveling the world. Uh, those are all great things, but I, I just, um, I, I, I want to know that the, I want to know that I can, I want to know that I can keep getting better. I want to know that people have faith in something. And if that's something can be me for anything at all. Well, it's just, it's an addiction. I don't know how else to put that. You know, um, we do a lot of charity work for my business. We support a lot of local children's programs, homeless shelters, um, uh, educational programs for children who live in homeless shelters. And, you know, the, the minute that you see a person, a human being, smile, um, become empowered, because of something you did for them, because of something that you said to them, because of an example that you set for them, 
it's like a forest fire inside your body. At least that's how it has been for me. Um, uh, my wife, who I'm married to right now, we've been married for five years. We met 10 years ago. She is my rock. Um, she is um, my, my greatest supporter, my benefactor. I would not be the person that I am right now if it wasn't for her and her support. You need support. And to try to do things on your own, as I talked about earlier today, it's, it's, it's not impossible, but man, it's not going to be easy. Um, having to change your social circle and stepping away from things that maybe are comfortable to you because they've been there your whole life, but you know are not good for you. They may have to go. There are some tough choices to make in order to succeed, to be strong, to do things that you know are right for you. And um, I've had to make a lot of those choices along the way. My social circle has changed dramatically and several times over, uh, but it's okay because I feel great. Uh, I've met you. We're having a great conversation today. Uh, we're going to talk to other people about it. And um, just just don't be afraid. Don't yeah. be afraid to change. And um, man, love life. Just mm. keep being positive. Have fun. You are such a great example of all of those things. And I want to close our conversation today with a quote that you had said during an interview back in 2011. Yes, I did my research on you. <laughs> you <laughs> said, people don't know what they are capable of doing, of what they can overcome. Limitations are always our own. Wow. I think that sums up everything you've been saying. Is Our limitations are what we make of them. And it's us having to break out of those boxes that we've set our minds around and getting out of those social circles we've been stuck in for so long or doing something that we never imagined ourselves to do. That's how that's how we yeah. grow and become better and impact lives. And, you know, uh, I, it, it's, it's very similar to the folks I struggle with every day in the gym who all day long, every 30 minutes will look at me at some point and say, I can't. I can't do this again. I can't. And what I found is so amazing is that all I have to do is put my index finger on their shoulder and say, now do it. And they do it. They can do it. It's, it's the, the power of support, the power of connectivity, the power of someone else having trust and faith in you. We all have limits. We have limits in strength. We have limits in pain tolerance. We have limits in energy. We have limits with our tolerance of stress. And just like you said, that's our box. And it's okay to have that box. It, it, that's our safe place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we feel scared to step outside that box. You know, we might die. We might hurt ourselves. We may not. It's the fear of the unknown. Um, but I always say, you know, uh, just try to live life realizing that box is all right in here. It's imaginary. And as soon as you start stepping outside that box, you'll start experiencing a better life, man. It's, it's, it's a wonderful time. So yeah, release your limitations. Believe that you're stronger than you think you are because you are. Everybody is. Wow. Marty, where can people find you? Um, you know, I'm, I am all over Facebook. Um, you can certainly hit me up on my personal page. It's easy to find me. Not too many of us out <laughs> running around with a Mohawk these days at 50 years old. Um, our, our Facebook page is also Extreme Fitness Personal Training. Um, we have our Instagram page is Extreme Fitness Training. Uh, and, um, you know, if you're in the Lower Bucks County area, um, we live in beautiful Ewing, New Jersey, which is only about eight miles away from our facility in Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania. It's a quick drive across the bridge. Um, you know, come and see us. Our facility is quite different. I'm very proud to say that in the 20 years I've owned it, no one has ever signed a contract. No one has ever paid a monthly fee. No one has ever made a multiple month agreement. We, um, we have a facility that is always pay as you go mm -hmm. so they pay for a training session we do it they put five dollar bills on a table and they take a group class and um, everybody told me in the beginning you're nuts you're never going to make it you have to charge a monthly fee how can you make money without contracts and uh it's it's it, be more passionate i tell everybody you know do your job better work harder and make these people know that you're there for them and so um you know i'm pretty easy to find 
And uh, I, I, uh, I say reach out. If you have questions, I'm happy to help you, man. Hit me up privately on Facebook Messenger. I'm easy to reach, man. Awesome. And I'm going to ask you a question to end our conversation today. It's a question I ask all of my guests. And I am so curious as to what your answer is. But how do you, Marty, cultivate curiosity in your life? Oh, how do I cultivate curiosity? Um, I, you know, curiosity is festering in me all the time. It's just I am, uh, I just, I'm a sponge and I ask questions. I'm not afraid. Um, losing my fear was a great thing. I'm not ashamed to not know things. Um, I, I love to, I, you know, three years ago on a whim, somebody dropped off a drum kit at my gym and said, if you know anybody who wants it, please take this. I'm like, I want it. I've always wanted to play drums. Here I am, man. I put the drum kit in my basement. Three years later, I'm, I'm, I'm guest sitting as a drummer for local bands. I don't know how the heck I pulled it off, but it's like everything else in my life. I put the sticks in my hands. I sat there and I went. So you know, if you live without curiosity, you're missing out mm-hmm. on so much of life. You'll never really know what's out there. You know, turn off the television set and go for a walk. Go to the park. Go to the museum. Go to the grounds for sculpture. Get some culture and um, open up your doors to learning. Just don't be afraid to learn. So, you know, I, I just, I can't imagine a life without curiosity, man. Me it's, either. Uh, wonderful aspect of being alive, of being human and being conscious of curiousness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's fantastic. So be curious, everybody, please. Please, please be curious and stay curious. Oh, Marty, yeah. thank you so much for your time today. Uh, ditto, Ben. Pleasure to talk with you.